This is a two-part video. There are two things going on in the U.S. Senate. There's a bill being considered to ban TikTok. And there's another bill that's related and broader which can also be used to ban TikTok and it's called the Restrict Act. I will discuss that in the next video. I've been watching the discussion of the dangers of TikTok in the media and the details have always been provided by people who are not experts in privacy, though apparently they are experts in politics. We need an objective analysis of the dangers of TikTok based on the same technical issues I've raised with other apps like Facebook or Google Apps, but without the political hype. There's also a lot of discussion of the dangers to society with a popular cultural influence that's under the control of a Chinese Communist Party, which has mastered the art of propaganda since the 1940s. And discussions saying apps like TikTok are dumbing down young people starting with Gen Z and creating a generation with the attention span of a gnat. I'm not going to get into any of this. I just want to help you analyze the dangers of the app itself from a privacy point of view, just based on technical details. What I hope you will glean from this is to gain the ability to analyze the dangers of any app and see if it really compromises your privacy. You'll also understand how apps actually work inside your phone and their limits. Stay right there. Let's start out with the whole app infrastructure on a mobile phone. I'll tell you how it works on Android and you can assume some similar structure on iOS. But since that's proprietary, we can't really gauge exactly how it is organized on Apple's ecosystem. First, the crazy thing about a phone is that this technology is so sophisticated now that there's not even a single software that's in control of the entire phone. The phone is made up of two distinct computers and subcomputers. The two computers are the application processor and the modem processor. The application processor is controlled by the phone OS, which is iOS or Android. And the modem processor is controlled by the maker of the baseband modem that handles the cell side of things. They work completely independently. Your graphical applications, which is what you appreciate as your normal phone function, is the one provided by iOS and Android. For this part of the discussion, I will refer to Google Android and not the de-Google Androids, which I talk about often. And from here, I will focus on Android only. It is Android that presents you with a basic user interface on your phone. And it is what controls all the peripherals, like turning off the phone and dialing out to the cell service and allowing you to run apps. But apps do not actually have the same kind of control of the mobile device as, let's say, an app on Windows. On Windows, an app has pretty much the same access and capability as even a system app made by Microsoft. Apps can have direct access to hardware, for example. On a mobile device, apps run in an environment that is limited by the OS, and it is called a virtual machine. This used to be called Dalvik on Android, and it is now referred to as Android Runtime. App developers write code that run only inside Android Runtime virtual machine, and they are forced to write it in the language accepted by Google, and that is Java. The native OS actually runs using C, and the C code can access the entire mobile device. In addition to apps running inside the virtual machine, an app has to be turned into an executable or compiled with a layer of permissions that becomes embedded in the app. In Android, this is called SE Linux, which is a framework called Mandatory Access Controls, or MAC. This means that any app has to have this framework built into it where the app developer decides in advance what permissions are allowed in the app. This declaration then imparts the security layer to the app that cannot be changed after the fact. So if the app developer decides that an app will not be allowed to access files or the microphone, 
then it will not be possible for the app to modify code in some way to gain access later on post installation. This is important because when you install an app, you immediately see the permissions it requires and then you can allow or deny those permissions. Each app also has a visible set of permissions that you can allow or deny and an app cannot hide this. The only flaw in this is if Android itself has not yet classified a specific permission or granted a user rights to allow or deny it. I remember when Android did not yet classify permissions for access to gyro sensors which are now used extensively for fitness apps. And those gyro sensors can be used to track location. But newer versions of Androids have locked these down so apps have a more specific list of permissions to acquire. In recent years, some of the app permissions that have been revoked for most apps are the ability to see fixed identifiers on the phone like the MAC address, the IMEI, IMZ, phone number, or network information like an ARP table. This kind of data was being abused by the likes of Facebook to identify people at the device level and allowed an app to find you even if you were on a different network with a different IP address. Now to be clear, there are still apps that have access to those identifiers. But these are limited to Google Apps. There can be no restrictions to system apps because they are controlled by the maker of the OS. That's why the solution here is to eliminate Google Apps using a D Google phone, after which no external party can obtain these identifiers on the app side. However, the modem processor always has access to these identifiers, at least those that pertain to cell data like IMEI and MZ and the phone number. I know what you're thinking. This is such a long discussion and I haven't even talked about TikTok. And the reason is that you need to understand the security framework under which any app operates or we will just be theorizing what an app can do. Now, I'm not a user of this type of app before, but I've been running TikTok on my Brax 2D Google phone for a couple of months, and I've been tracking it to see what the danger is. Fortunately, being a D Google phone, I have other safeguards beyond what is available to a typical Google Android. With any app, there are two sets of privacy dangers. One is if the app can obtain your identity. And secondly, if it can create a profile of you from your data that is then attached to that identity. So specifically, let's discuss what TikTok can do to both. Now it's up to you to learn to protect yourself and I've taken these precautions with TikTok. I signed up with TikTok using a segregated email address that I don't use for important things. I use an email that doesn't indicate a real name. I use TikTok only either on cell data or on a VPN, or in my case, a VPN router at my home. Also, TikTok did not force me to do two-factor authentication, so I did not have to provide a phone number. Now, I have a special phone number for this purpose, 2FA, which I used to segregate my identity, but it did not ask for it. By the way, the moment it starts asking for 2FA and forcing it like Facebook, then this app has to be deleted immediately. So far, it has not done that. Okay, I'll be frank. This app is so stupid that if you're not Gen Z, then you can survive without ever running it. I don't have the kind of attention span where this would constitute as fun. Basically, aside from stupid sayings, the app is really focused on sexual innuendos and whatever attention-seeking stunt you can put in short form. But hey, I'm not going to judge what you consider as fun. However, from a privacy point of view, let's talk about what this app can find out about me. I looked at app permissions and yes, there were a couple of dangerous options enabled there. One was the calendar and the other was file and media access. Maybe this is something related to creators uploading videos. Otherwise, these permissions can definitely be misused. 
Read access to a calendar can reveal names and activities. File access is ultra dangerous if misused, since TikTok could theoretically scan files on your device. We're not yet at the permission level where you can restrict an app to a particular folder only if you grant file permissions. Since I'm not uploading videos, these permissions do not concern me, so I turn them off. Also, if you're smart, you will turn off location permissions, camera, microphone, and the critical one is contacts. Now, if you enable all these permissions, then I can't help you. It doesn't matter what the app is. You will screw yourself privacy-wise. You do not need the CCP as a scapegoat. Your data will be public, particularly locations and IP addresses. But we will assume you paid attention here and removed all permissions to TikTok for your Gen Z kid and for yourself. Now, as with any app, and I mean every single one, including Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, if you have a standard normie phone, meaning iOS or Google Android, then your device will leak certain identifiers. This is not unique to TikTok. Your device model info called the user agent and advertising ID, your Google ID, your IP address will obviously be revealed. This is available to any website you visit. Now I've countered these identifiers by using a VPN router at my house and a Google phone which has limited information on a user agent and it doesn't have a Google ID or advertising ID. Given all this, what is exactly the risk to me with using TikTok? Assuming you've taken the same steps as I have, then TikTok will fail to identify me, meaning I would have completely blocked its ability to gain a fixed identity. So now let's see what it can get about me on the profiling behavior or data side. Yeah, okay, I'm flicking through the same stupid shorts that are fed to me by default. Yeah, it reveals so much about me. It knows I'm in the tech field and in privacy. It knows what I do for a living and my likes. Come on, guys. Really? Just common sense. And you know you're watching useless things. And they know you're watching useless things. Is this good for your kids' education? Are the sexual innuendos healthy for young teens? Is the content censored so there is nothing negative about the CCP? Hey. These are good questions, but does it rise to a level where the U.S. government needs to step in and ban the Zucking app? By the way, this app is already banned in China, and apparently there are anti-CCP videos on this app. I didn't look for it, but apparently they said it's there. Okay, let's focus on a typical kid user who has no knowledge of phone security and is unsupervised by a parent. Are there security issues here that affect the United States? Well, the kid will definitely reveal locations, IP addresses, and general browser fingerprinting information, which will set up an identity that can be attached to the login ID. Could a CCP then instruct ByteDance, the owner of TikTok, to examine the network of this kid, who, through some other process, has been identified to be in the household of a U.S. government employee with access to secure information? Well, yes, it could happen. But the app cannot operate outside of its SE Linux limitations or app permissions. SE Linux, by the way, was originally made by the NSA, and this is now built into every Android. I'm sure iOS has something equivalent. So without permissions, the app is hobbled from active surveillance. Just be aware of that. As you can see, any app with some permissions can be used for a nefarious purpose. And I'll be clear with you, the most nefarious app of all is Facebook. Facebook early on was tracking MAC addresses of devices on your network to spy on who was associating with whom. That's an example of dangerous behavior. Facebook, Google, and yes, TikTok are hell-bent on collecting contact lists. Contact lists can definitely be abused. You can discover who's connected to whom and can be used to identify people. And yes, I will tell you that TikTok was continuously feeding prompts to access contact lists. So a kid user would 
automatically do this without thinking and the parent's phone number will be uploaded to TikTok. But again, this is the same danger with all apps. It is not specific to TikTok. The fear, of course, is that TikTok is under the control of a government that may not have friendly intentions. And that is a legitimate added fear. However, as you can see from my analysis of the technical limitations in apps, there is a limit to what it can do. Let's theorize some typical fears I've seen discussed. Can TikTok be used to remote control a device and be a keylogger, which is the scariest cybersecurity threat there is? No, it doesn't have permissions for that. It can't override SE Linux mandatory access controls. I'd worry more about apps that are granted permissions and could abuse it. An example app that has such permissions is LogMeIn. If LogMeIn were under the control of the CCP, I would likely ban it in the US for security reasons. Here are some permissions that would clue me in to potential key logging. Run foreground service, have full network access, query all packages, camera. Can TikTok examine the network just like Facebook did to look for MAC addresses? Although this was something Facebook did, even Facebook cannot do this anymore because that capability was removed from Android since Android 10. Thus, TikTok can't do it either. Can TikTok remotely turn on the camera and the microphone? This would be a critical use for a spy app controlled by a foreign power. Yes, it has that permission, so it is possible just like any other app that has this permission. Fortunately, you can turn these permissions off. Can TikTok do cross-device tracking? Meaning, can TikTok track your internet use on multiple devices? I saw a video by a major YouTuber where one TikTok account was disabled for moderation purposes and another TikTok account was automatically disabled and the YouTuber assumed it was doing cross-device tracking since they were different accounts. Assuming permissions weren't restricted, then it is possible for a location and IP address to specify it is the same user. But this is not a full cross-device tracking. At the moment, the only two players with the ability for sophisticated cross-device tracking is Google and Facebook. The reason is that practically every website is running Google Analytics, which is Google code. So Google can observe traffic directly at those websites and is able to see incoming Google IDs. Facebook has something similar with the Facebook like button on many websites and those websites can also see the Facebook ID. TikTok has no such infrastructure. In fact, no other app does. So all it can do is the same third party tracking available to all which is the advertising ID, IP address, and location. Things, fortunately, you can control. So in conclusion, in its current form, TikTok may be a bad influence on in our culture, and that is the general fault with many social media apps. It could have been Vine instead of TikTok, or maybe it could have been YouTube Shorts. But that is a legitimate conversation that can occur. But as a privacy threat, if there is a threat, you can pretty much limit that by disabling all permissions and use a VPN router at your home. And even more, you can use a de-Google phone, which will prevent any identification of your device. These threats exist with all apps, not just TikTok. So if the US wants to ban TikTok, then it is legitimately expected that every other country could ban YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, and even Google Analytics as they pose an even greater threat. The point is, it is a can of worms, and I'm not sure you could just do this without consequences to the entire world of big tech. Folks, I have privacy products that protect your data, so it will not be exposed to any rogue app. We have a Brax2 privacy phone, running an open source Brax OS that makes your phone invisible. We also do flashing services 
to the Google other phone models on our store, as well as stocking pre-flashed pixels. We have a VPN service, Bytes VPN, which has features like Tor routing, DNS obfuscation, and ad blocking. We have Braxmail, which is a metadata free way of doing email where no one knows where the message originated from. These products are on my app, Braxme. Come visit us there. The link is in the description. Thank you for watching and make sure to watch the next video that follows us because they're connected.